church? Um, I, before I read this, I just want to say thank you for all the texts, the calls, the prayers for my dad the last few weeks. Um, obviously, it's been it's been a lot for um, me, my my mom, and my two brothers. Obviously, um, there's not a whole lot of words I can describe. But I just say thank you. Um, we were overwhelmed by all your love, support, and your um, kindness towards us in these last few weeks. Um, my dad, um, he is a rock. He's what makes our family, the Freeman family. Um, he's the reason why I'm so proud to wear my last name with pride. Um, so it's been a lot. Not gonna lie. So um, I just want to, all I can say is thank you from the bottom of my heart and speaking on behalf of my mom, my brothers, and obviously my dad, who's excited to be back here with his church family when he's ready to do so. So I'm gonna read from Habakkuk 3.2. Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in all of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time. Make them known. In wrath, in wrath remember mercy. Please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm so, so beyond grateful for you and this church family today. As over the last few weeks, me and my family, I've seen, I've seen what this church is capable of in this community, in the love, the kindness, the passion, they have showed us over the last two weeks, Lord. And I'm so beyond excited for what's next, Lord, for this church, for my family, for this church family. Um, I got to see your love, your true love, your compassion in the darkest of times, in the lowest of lows. So Lord, I just wish you would be with everyone in this congregation today. And as we move forward to another week, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, it's not every day you get to see a verse lived out by a family. And to know that the Freeman family, the whole family, and us collectively have like, Lord, do it. Lord, do it. Lord, do it. And uh, to beg of God to repeat, to beg of God to do his awe-inspiring things. And he does. And he does. And how awesome is that? Uh, as we study Habakkuk, as we study a minor prophet, um, as we go forward, we, we talked last week about Nahum and, and troubles, and it's out of our troubles that we get to proclaim the Lord is good. And I'm telling you, open heart surgery is a trouble, and we open our hearts to the Lord because he is good. He is good. And here's the thing. What do you do in the midst of that, in the waiting for the goodness? And this is where Habakkuk steps in. And this is where Habakkuk's going to come forward. And, and I want to frame it uh, with this phrase. Uh, it's a paradox. It's one of those things you say, and it's like, well, there's the preacher speaking out two sides of his mouth. But here it is, and I, and I want you to kind of kind of rest with it. I'm going to repeat it throughout this sermon, and hopefully it takes hold. But here's what I want us to think about with Habakkuk. It's this right here. Bring God all your questions. Don't question God. And some are going to say, the, what? But I want us to walk through this in, in this sermon today. Bring God all your questions. There is not a question that you cannot bring before your Father. Bring them all. Don't question God. And we're going to walk through this. There is no question that you cannot bring before God. But the question of God will determine how you handle this life. Um, questions are fun, and so let's, let's get into some fun questions. I've got some third grade, graders, I almost spoke like a third grader there. I've got some third graders that were given the task to write a question to God, and so we'll go through this. Notice a couple things that uh, none of them use question marks. I thought that was interesting, so that's not taught till fourth grade. Um, and, and oddly enough, some of their handwriting is better than yours and mine. But here's the first question from Lucy, from Lucy. Dear God. Are, uh, are you really invisible, or is that just a trick? <laughs> and Lucy signed her name thinking, got it. Got it. Here's, uh, here's another one. Dear God, Norma asks, did you mean for the giraffe to look like that? <laughs> or was it an accident? <laughs> Neil's got a question. Neil says, hey, hey God, 
This is, this is like you're pulling up close. This is the kind of question where like you're whispering in their ear. Dear God, I went to this wedding and they kissed right in the church. Is that okay? Dear God, on, on Halloween, I'm going to wear a devil's costume. Is that all right with you? Listen, this kid got toothpaste at every single house. That's what he got, okay? He learned his lesson. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Going forward. We got another one. This one's from Nan. Nan, dear God, who draws the lines around the countries? It's a good question. How did they get there? I've got one more, and listen... If you ever thought, you know, some third graders get pretty deep, here we go. This is from Charlie, I think. I'm not quite sure how to read his name. How did you know you were God? Okay, Charlie's asking some deep questions. I, I want to jump uh, back here. Bring God all your questions. Don't question God. Uh, some of you may be in a relationship. Some of you may, maybe it's through work, maybe it's spouse, maybe it's the one near you. But some of us, we have this amazing ability to ask questions that are actually complaints. Let me, let me, let me explain. Are you going to wear that? You guys know what I'm saying right there? Huh? That wasn't the question like, to be answered. That was go change your clothes. Okay? Uh, maybe you, now this is, I've done a lot of traveling. Um, when my child, and it's always Ellie, asks how much longer she really doesn't care. She is voicing her complaint of, can we be there? Can we get there? How much longer? If you, are at, if you are that kind of person at a restaurant that says, oh, how much longer? Do you know what they're not going to do? They're not going to go back and hey, uh, how long on that? They know. You're just saying, hey, hurry this up. Hurry this along. We can veil complaints. Um, have, have you, gentlemen, has your spouse ever come in, gentlemen, and ask, hey, why is the TV so loud? They're not asking why. Like, well, I really enjoy this program, and, and I audibly want to be a mate. They're telling you, turn it down. Okay? There are a lot of questions that can be veiled as complaints. And what we need to notice, as Habakkuk is coming forward and questioning God, a lot of you are going, well, that sounds like a complaint. And we've got to understand, if the prophet of God in his holy book, is displaying himself, questioning God, that comes across as complaints. Who here in this room can come forward to God with questions veiled as complaints? Every single one of us. Okay? God can handle our questions. We can bring all our questions to God, even when they are complaints. How much longer, God? And it's not in reference to a meal, it's in reference to hell. How much longer, God? We can bring any question to God. I know some of you have offered the question, God, I thought, fill in the blank, you were going to be with me in this relationship? That you were going to allow me to move forward where I needed to be financially or in the job or the career I wanted to get? That there is complaint sessions that we have and we call them prayer. And, and guess what? God is there. And it's all right. I want to say this because the reason I know that we can lament or cry out or complain is, is well, Dennis is going to bring this up. But let me, let me break down Habakkuk for us. I've got a third grader named Dennis with a question. But, but when you open the book of Habakkuk, three chapters, it's a quick read. Understand this. Habakkuk's just, he's just conflicted. Because he is a man of faith, and he's seen a whole bunch of struggles. And so some of us, I know we have been in that place. So for him to come forward, he's in a place of conflict, he's laying out his complaints, and he's doing it in faith. And in the first two chapters, there's the dialogue. There's a question and answer between him and God. And in chapter 3 is a prayer. It's a prayer that's meant to be a song. And, and we'll get there, but I want us to see we can get to this place of questioning because as... Here's what Dennis asked God. Dear God, my grandpa says you were around when he was a little boy. How far back do you go? <laughs> I'll tell you this. Our good father goes back far enough that if you look in the book of Job, you, 
you're going to see a very similar instance to the questioning and the concerns that Habakkuk has. And what we've got to understand with Job, he's crying out, why, God, why is this occurring? And if you know the story of Job, if something could go bad, it happened. If something could go wrong, it did in his life. And he's crying out to the Lord, but yet the Lord's response isn't quite an answer. It's, hey, I'm God, and there's some concepts here, there's some realities here, there's some things you're not going to quite understand. And how many of us struggle when the answer is not really the answer we want? We just kind of sit and wait. Come into Habakkuk, here we go. Habakkuk cries out with this question, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed. There is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. I put a bunch of text up here because I want you to look for a second. Look through the eyes of an American. I think you're going to find some similarities here. I think we could sit with Habakkuk in this. How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help? That second line up there says, but you do not listen. But you do not listen. And I know that in this room, there are people that have sat in the chair of, God, why will you not listen? And we have sat there for what has seemed and is actually year after year. God, why will you not listen? And I know in this room, there are some of you that you received gifts from God you didn't even ask for. And the guy sitting right next to you has been begging for it for years. God, why won't you answer? And then there's the hidden stuff. There's the stuff we pull back. There's, we will talk about some things. Okay, I love you as a family. There's things we will audibly say. We will, we will have conversations. And then there's the stuff that we keep behind us. Then there's the stuff we hold back. Then there's the stuff that this is just for me, and, and I'm going to leave this one at home. It's questions like this. God, how long am I going to be tempted to put that needle in my arm? God, how long am I going to be tempted to hide the bottle? How long am I going to fight the urge? There's these desires we won't speak of. But I want to flip it for a second. There are some questions asking how long we are on the receiving end of the pain. As the young lady on a Monday morning begins putting on the makeup, she's got to put it on extra thick. Because she cries out and the tears are mixing with the makeup as she says, How long, O oh Lord, will I have to put up with the abuse? As she covers the marks from the one who claims God and yet treats her ungodly. We've got to understand there's, there's fun questions that kids will ask. There's some questions internally that we struggle with, but we've got to understand the reality that there are some questions amongst our family and, and family members out there. They're, they're deep and they're hard, and they can be faith shakers. And so we've got to understand we can bring all questions to God, but we come back to the understanding we do not question God. Going to Habakkuk, going to his day, here's what's going on. He's looking around and he goes, God, it's all awful. You could just shorten that to two words. It's God awful. It's terrible. Everywhere he looks, he sees something awful. And God's going to respond, okay? This is how God responds as we move along in verse 1, or chapter 1. The Lord replied, I want you to look. You're going to be amazed. I'm raising up the Babylonians. 
Those of you who don't know the context, let me put it in your context. God, I'm looking around, there's a lot of violence. I'm looking around, there's politically corrupt. God, I'm looking around, and what I see in this country is we're pushing down the little man. Will there be any justice? Are you going to do anything? And God's response is, hey, listen, I'm going to raise up the Taliban, and I'm going to bring him in just to beat everyone up. What? I mean, if that was the response, you say, what? God, what are you talking about? Let's pause for a second. We can bring all our questions to God. We do not question God. To put Habakkuk in the understanding, wait, 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 you're telling me you're bringing a terrorist organization in to cleanse us and take, God, is that your plan? But this is how he opens. This is how he speaks to God. In chapter 1, he's going he's to ask a second question. He's going to come back. The, the Lord has said, hey, I'm bringing the Babylonians. I'm bringing the army. They're going to wipe you out. Oh, Lord, my God. My Holy One, you who are eternal. Habakkuk can bring any question. He's not questioned who God is. And he is elevating him in this place. Oh, Lord, my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal. I've got to paraphrase a little bit the next part, but I think this is the best paraphrase. What? Are, are you kidding me? God, are you serious? I'm asking for help, and you're sending the enemy in to destroy us. That's your response. And some of us, when we cry out to God, the most opposite thing seems to take place. The thing that doesn't make sense. We ask for relief, we get more grief. God, what are you doing? And this is what's going on in Habakkuk's day. And this is then how we pray. Okay, Habakkuk's going to pray in this way, and this is what we do. And I want to, Larry is going to show us this. Dear God. Maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each other so much if they had their own rooms. <laughs> it works with me and my brother. And so what we do is we get a response from God, and our, our question or the way we respond is we start telling him how to do his job. And we, we, we started with maybe, maybe. But this is what Habakkuk's going to do. He's going to come forward and give God... A, hey, I, I want to suggest a couple things. Job does the same thing. This is how it goes. Are you going to let him get away with this? Are you going to let this happen? And then he says, I'm going to be like a watchman. I'm just going to sit and I'm going to await your response to my complaint. If you want to know the cycle of how Habakkuk goes, he issues his, his question, which is a complaint. You can go either way. He then waits... But his response is where we need to constantly be. He rejoices. He rejoices. Listen, there has yet to be something to rejoice about in what Habakkuk's been bringing forward. Will you let them get away with this? I await your response. The Lord responds this way. If you need one verse from Habakkuk, obviously we sang one, we read one, but I would suggest you hold on to this one. Habakkuk 2.4. God responds this way. He says, look at the proud. They trust in themselves, their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Okay, he's going to point to two groups. There is only two groups in this scenario. God is responding to Habakkuk, who is struggling with the understanding that things are going to get worse. And he's going to respond, he goes, hey, look, look at the proud. Here are the proud ones. You want to know, who, you want to know what pride is? Pride is looking at a situation, seeing what God has decided, seeing what God has said, and goes... I think I'm going to do it my way. I think I have a better idea. I think I can handle this one. He says, look at the proud. Look at the ones who, who take the place of God in their lives. They trust in who? Do they trust in the Lord? No, they trust in themselves. And by and large, their lives are crooked. Do you guys have this option day after day, time after time, to trust in what the Lord is guiding you in or to go your own way? And here's the problem. A lot of us, we want to act, and sometimes what the Lord is telling us to do is to do that second part. It's wait. Oh. Whew. I do, I've got a couple waiters, waitresses in here. Do you do nothing but sit around? No. Huh? You're pretty active. You're on your feet, right? We've got to understand, in the waiting period, it doesn't mean we sit and we twiddle our thumbs. We keep going on with life. But we leave space 
for the Lord's response. We keep serving, we keep doing, and we leave that gap for the Lord's response. Too many of us, have you met someone that while you're talking with them, they immediately respond before they've gotten your answer? <laughs> What's the point of being in the conversation? This is how some of us pray. Dear God, I'm going to take care of it. Let's give some space for God to be God. Walking forward here, Habakkuk uh, in the chapter 2, God is going to lay out five woes. He's going to talk about the prideful, he's going to talk about the righteous, and he's going to look at five groups. Greed, exploitation, violence, immorality, and idolatry. And he's not just describing Babylon, he's describing his holy people as well. He said, hey, I've got, I've got some problems. I'm going to wipe it out, I'm going to cleanse it, I'm going to purify it. And this is what God ends chapter 2 saying. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. How many of you in your prayer life, there's times of silence? How many of you can talk with God and leave space for silence? Well, Rob, that becomes nap time. I will fall asleep if I do that. You know, how many of us, we, we throw words at God while we're running by? Like some of our relationships are that way. Some of you, in, in your season of life, you're, you're, you're married, you've got kids, you've got jobs, everything's going on, and you can't sit still to actually have a conversation with your spouse. How does that go over? I can tell you from experience, not very well. But there needs to be a place to pause, to sit, and to be silent. And some of us think that when, when the alarm clock rings, we can just sprint the entire day just shouting commands at God and then go to sleep and think it's going to work out. But we've got, to, we've got to recognize who the Lord is. We've got to give the reverence that is due Him as the Holy One and let there be a gap, let there be a place of silence. And it is hard. It is hard to pause. Bring God every single one of your questions. Bring him every single one. Lay silent before him. And don't question him. That's God. Habakkuk's response, chapter 3, is going to be prayer. It's going to be song. We sang it earlier. That's how it's intended. The whole chapter 3 is intended to be sang. And it begins, as, as Kyle read for us, Lord, I have heard of your faith. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Here's the thing. Have you heard of the Lord's faith? Do you recognize what he's doing? Do you understand that he is a loving father that wants his children, who is bringing his children? Lord, I've heard of your faith. I've heard have you pulled people out of bondage. I've heard have you pulled people out of sin. I've heard you pull people out of death, out of illness, out of sickness. Lord, I've heard of these things. I've seen these things. I am amazed by these things. Please do it again. Please do it again. Make it known in our day. He's going to go on in his prayer, but I want to get to the end of the prayer, or we'll end this morning. 17 and 18 and 19. He's going to give us the end of his prayer, and it is a pattern for us to pray. He is going to lay out, for some of us, I don't know how to pray, so all I do is complain. That's where some of us are at. God, give it to me. My next prayer is, God, you didn't give it to me. My third prayer is, God, when are you going to give it to me? Recycle, repeat, keep it going. He's going to give us a pattern of prayer. Let me read first the verses, then we'll break it down. Habakkuk says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms, there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails, and the fields lie empty and barren. Even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. 
I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. This is how Habakkuk ends his prayer. I want to back up for a second and just break something down. Verse 17, he's putting himself in the situation of Job, even though you could take it all away. Take it all away. Clear out the pantry. Clear out all the finances. Take it all away. Even though all that could happen. It's gone, y'all. Even though anything I desire, anything I want, anything I would like to have, it's gone. Even though. Yet I. Even though you pulled it all away. My health, my relationships, my money, my people, my possessions, my property, any of those things. Even though, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in the God of my salvation. The Lord is. Even though, yet I, Lord is. This is the pattern of prayer Habakkuk gives us. I want you to notice something. Even though, yet I, the Lord is. The even those are the longest. The prophet Habakkuk, as he gives us this pattern of prayer, he says, lay it out. Even though, even though, even though, complain. Even though, even though. May the gripes just be laid out. Even though. And the yet I is so simple. Yet I'll rejoice. Why? Why, why can I, in the midst of all the even those, why can't I rejoice? Because you are the God of what? The God of my salvation. The joy is not in the fact that the even those are failing to be met. Even though the knee aches, even though the pantry's empty, even though the 401k means nothing to me, I don't know what that is. Even though all my family members seem to be angry with me, even though I have a splitting headache, even though when I take one look outside the door, all I want to do is to crawl into a cave. Is there a way to have human hibernation? And can I do it for eight years? Even though all this stuff is going on, yet I. Guys, if we were being real, we could fill a whole book of even those. We could lay out the even those. But the yet I is one, and it is simple. Yet I will rejoice because of who you are, God. And you are the one that is calling me home. You are the one that's providing eternal salvation. You are the Father that loves me enough to come after me in your Son. Yet I, I'll rejoice. Whatever you hold in the even though hand does not compare to the simple yet I of who God is. The Lord is my strength. Even though yet I, the Lord is. I want you to catch something there. He says, the Lord is, let me, let me bounce back for a second. The Lord is my strength. Okay, so whose strength do we have? You're still with me, this is great. Okay, so we have the Lord's strength. This last phrase, he makes me as sure-footed as a deer. That's cool. What does that mean, that I'm going to run in front of a car while I'm driving down James Road? No, not that deer. <laughs> makes me as sure-footed as a deer that does what? Able to tread upon the heights. Have you guys seen what looks like a 90-degree cliff face, and then you see a deer just going up it, and you go, what in the world? Have you seen the animal doing something that makes no sense? Here's the thing. There are going to be situations in your life that there's no way in our own abilities for us to be able to scale, for us to be able to walk, for us to be able to climb. It ain't you and I. It's the Lord. And when we look and we see brothers and sisters making impossible steps and doing things beyond comprehension, we got to say, the Lord is sure-footed with them. When we see someone walking through how awful of a situation it can be to lose a loved one, how awful it is to have a job taken, a house taken, and to see them still being sure-footed, we've got to look and say, the Lord is. And we've got to let our brothers and sisters know when we see the Lord is working amongst them. 
Here's the prayer pattern. Even though, lay out those complaints. Even though, lay out those gripes. Even though, those little things that never happen. You know what it's like when you look into the stocking on Christmas morning, that thing you were hoping there ain't there. Even though! <sighs> Yet I. And no matter how big your gripe is, it cannot supersede how big God is. Because he is the God of our salvation. And this isn't one of those, all right, I'm going to hype you up and go out hiking, go out do something awesome. No, 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 no. Even though, yet I recognize who God is, it's the Lord. It's the strength of the Lord. It's his strength. It's his sure-footedness. It is him walking us forward in this. And so I come back to this, and I'm hoping you've got it. Bring God all your questions. Don't question God. Bring God all your questions. But with a heart of honesty, with a heart of reverence, understanding that he is the Lord of lords, he is the King of kings, bring him all the questions. But don't question for a minute. You know what? I think I should have the God job. I think I should be the Lord of lords. I think I would make a better King of kings. Because when we walk into that pride, we live crooked lives. We've walked away from faith. And it is by faith we are saved. It is by faith we belong to the Father. It is by faith that we have an almighty Savior in Jesus Christ. So this question coming from Jane. Dear God, what does it mean you are a jealous God? I thought you had everything. And God is jealous for the hearts he does not have. God desperately seeks those hearts that have decided they will be their own God. They will make their own choices. They will follow their own prideful ways. We have a jealous God, and it is a God of love. And look, he's not looking for something that's not his. He is jealous for what belongs to him and someone else is taking. And so when we talk about a jealous God, it's not that he's looking and feeling like, oh man, I need more. No, no, no. Someone has taken something that is his, and he hurts with the understanding he wants it. He wants them home. Here's the thing. God will be jealous for your life. And some of you need to hear this. God is jealous for your day-to-day -day decisions. Some of you are content to go, well, you got my life, Lord, and then you live your own way. You follow the way of pride. You follow the way of self, and you recognize there is a jealous God going, I want those decisions. I'm jealous for the obedience. I'm jealous for you to walk the way I would have you to walk. And at the same point, our God, we've got to recognize there are people he desires, people he wants to know him people that he wants us as his family, as his believers, to turn, to point, and allow them to see the beauty that is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. To understand there is something so beautiful about a father that wants you home, that he sets it upon himself to go after you to the point of his own death, to take upon himself the pain you deserve, the punishment you deserve, the justice you deserve, and to swallow that, and to take that, and to rise anew, so you can twofold have the sin removed and the righteousness restored, and you can walk in relationship with your Lord. This is Habakkuk. This is the book where we can question, we can wait, but ultimately it should come to rejoicing. And so I want to say you can be a couple of places right now this morning. You can be in a place of, of lifting up questions. I pray you wait. God, where do you want me to go? God, how do you want me to live? God, what are you going to do in this scenario? And that's the best way to question, to recognize he is God. Keep him as God. Bring all your questions. And I will tell you this, some of us, we question like third graders. Some of us, we question out of the scars that we have in our life. But I hope all of us look together and understand we are to be a family of God, sharing in the pleasures of God, 
knowing how great our God is. And so we're going to worship, we're going to sing, I'm ready to turn it over to the worship room. And I want you to know as we come in, in a time of kind of wrapping this up and ending this up, I hope, I hope for you guys that we can keep offering up questions. I hope that we can be willing enough to let some family members know we're either in the waiting period, we're in the questioning period, or man, I, I just want to rejoice. And I hope you know we've got a table provided, one that we've shared with the Lord's Supper, but one of communicating, the one of socializing, one of sharing in this potluck meal. I've got it on good authority. I wrote it down. I skipped it at the beginning of my sermon. Miss Harriet told me she's got it all covered. She brought five loaves and two fish. We're all eating today. Feast on the Lord. Feast on the Lord.